Uh, so presenting on this article, it's uh, got a long title, uh, Decrease of Post-Chemotherapy Complications with the Use of Probiotics in Children with ALL. And there we go. So the lead author for this article, uh, Jesus just bring up here, they were listed as first uh, in the article list. They were also the most senior. Um, so I just mostly wanted to focus on them. Um, this uh, study was done in Mexico City, the, the, and this author is the head of teaching research uh, at, it's actually a um, hospital for, for uh, employees of um, petroleum, um, the, the state, or the uh, country's petroleum um, uh, development in, um, in the country. So. Uh, they're head of teaching and research there, published 26 papers. Uh, one uh, on a similar topic on GI side effects and patients with ALL. Um, I couldn't find anything on prior training for this, this person. I looked as much as I could and I couldn't find anything as far as where they, their education was or things like that. Um, and then all the authors in this article um, were from the same um, hospital, um, the Hospital Central. De Alta, terrible pronunciation, um, um, except for um, one author uh, who is a medical geneticist at the General Hospital of uh, Mexico. So this study was performed um, just to evaluate for GI complications uh, because uh, there's a common side effect from chemo, um, with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, things like that. So. Uh, these, these complications can increase the risk of hospital readmissions, ED visits, uh, use of um, antimicrobials and, and infections after receiving chemo. Um, so probiotics have been proposed to uh, be um, used for management for patients undergoing chemo. So what we know about uh, using probiotics um, for patients undergoing chemo at this point, uh, it's, it's often recommended. There's a lot of websites um, uh, that will specifically recommend using probiotics um, for patients undergoing chemo, uh, but it's still uh, not a lot that's known about it. There's a couple studies that come up um, um, in the past for similar studies. For example, there's 150 patient uh, control trial in 2007, which found a significant decrease in uh, severe diarrhea, fewer hospitalizations, and dose rejections due to bowel toxicity for patients undergoing chemo. Uh, there's also 46 patient control trials. Uh, in 2015, it found less frequent and severe diarrhea, but did not find any significant uh, difference uh, in the results. And then um, this study in 2019, which was performed by these same authors for this study, um, there was a 60 patient control trial um, that found a significantly statistically significant decrease in the GI side effects as well. Um, but still, it's, it's, it's recommended by a lot of people, but it's not really standard of care at this point. Um, so again, this study was completed at um, that, that same hospital, Hospital Centro Sur de Alta Especialidad, which uh, belongs to uh, Petróleos Mexicanos, which is uh, basically the hospital offers services to relatives, workers in the Mexican national oil system. So the population that's being studied are specifically relatives of the Mexican national oil system workers. Uh, and this was uh, conducted in Mexico City uh, in Mexico. And obviously, this for patients um, uh, with ALL, they were undergoing uh, induction or reinduction um, therapy. So the generalizability, I mean, it, it still applies to patients with ALL, but it's uh, somewhat limited. Still, it's in a different country. It's patients undergoing a specific uh, chemo regimen, which I can go into in a little bit, um, and it's it's specifically for relatives of the oil system workers. But at the same time, I wouldn't really expect their response to to probiotics to significantly differ from other patients with ALL. Um, so this study was published in 2021. It's a recent study, so the re results are definitely relevant. Um, uh, time-wise to, to current treatments. Um, the, the total time over which this study was performed, it's not really clear. Um, but 
for each of these patients, they were monitored for 30 days following treatment, so I don't know kind of the catchment area for, for when they started following uh, patients through when the, pub, the article was published. <clears throat> so for how, um, this article mentions that it's a prospective cohort, but it also talks about uh, randomly assigning patients into two groups. Uh, one was patients with uh, taking probiotics and oops, one group uh, that did not take um, probiotics. So um, I'm not sure why it was listed as a prospective cohort. Um, it, it was kind of interesting to me in that respect, at least, at least as far as looking at the methods. Um, but it, and it was a single blind study as well, uh, which can lead to some um, uh, issues with, with uh, confounding. Um, but this, this study was set up with 60 children with ALL. Again, they were admitted for induction or reinduction chemo, randomly assigned to two groups. Treatment group, they had 30 patients who got uh, the lactobacillus twice daily for a max of seven days um, during administration of chemo, and the control group, which did not get uh, probiotics, and then both received um, standard chemo, uh, which was prednisone, vincristine, danarubicin, and aspirogenase. Yes? Uh, so the way I interpreted it when I was reading it was that they must have done a, another study before yes. this that was the RCT, where they, where they you know, randomized the two groups. They probably studied them during the admission or time scale. And this was the prospective cohort study of following that original study group. So I think that's just why they worked this way. Yeah, so that's, that's what I was wondering too. What, what Dr. Fink was saying is basically um, this was uh, essentially still a prospective study just following the randomized control trial that for the study was performed in 2019. Um, I was trying to work through that too, and that's why I was curious what people's thoughts were on that because, um, I mean, initially they still were randomized into two groups. So in that respect, the, the process in which they were isolated into one of two groups is still randomized. So I'm not sure that I necessarily agree, but I don't know, like... Uh, I think because it's basically an information finding study on a study that they already had done. Yeah. That's why they're calling it a prospective study. I see. Yeah, I mean, I think it's still valid yeah. because they were randomized. But you do lose a little bit of, uh, like, I'm sure that some of the original randomization methods didn't make it into this one. Yeah. So it is by chance they get through that study. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the, the criteria for inclusion for the, the, this study with children under 17 with ALL in uh, induction or reinduction, where parents signed informed consent. The exclusion was uh, antibiotic use in the last 15 days, had a medical fast, eight, had an active infection, uh, had a need for a GI or major surgical procedure or, or neutropenic, um, and then no, no patients were actually eliminated uh, from this um, sample. So for statistical analyses, um, there were a couple different analyses that were performed. One was a student's t-test, which was used to compare uh, means of the two uh, treatment groups, the chi-squared test to compare differences in proportions between the two groups. They also calculated a number needed to treat um, for um, GI complications, which was performed at the start and at the end of treatment for both groups. Uh, they calculated a relative risk of GI complications between the two groups. I didn't see in there a mention of alpha um, based on uh, what was said throughout the course of the article as far as analyses. It looked like it was um, an alpha of 0.05, though, which is standard, um, especially when it's not uh, specifically mentioned otherwise. So these patients were monitored for 30 days um, uh, by basically two different methods. One, the patient kept a diary where they would monitor their temperature, monitor for any GI symptoms that they had during that 30-day period. Uh, and then uh, the electronic health record was also um, monitored as well um, as far as for GI symptoms, development of infections, 
use of antibiotics, number of ED visits, number of hospitalizations, um, and if they received a diagnosis of sepsis during that period. Um, so as far as potential uh, issues with the study design or statistical information, uh, again, I, like I've mentioned, this was a single blind study, so it is prone to bias, and it seems to be a little more experimental in nature as well, just because the initial groups were, were assigned randomly versus um, more just observed based on their own or the physician's de decision to, to assign them to get probiotics or not. Uh, so um, not sure whether relative risk would be um, uh, relevant in this case. Um, how could it lead to confounding? I thought it was a translational issue. Oh, well, as, as far as what was a translational issue? Um, as far as leading to, or sorry, yeah, it would lead to bias. Um, how do I unmute? Can you hear me? Yes. So how does the single blinded study lead to bias? Um, just for the fact that if it's not, I mean, for a study to not be double blinded, th there can be issues from the uh, observer's standpoint that could lead towards whether they interpret it a certain way or lead the uh, patient to kind of act differently or, or interpret different things. I mean, in general, a single blind study, um, you're, you're introducing bias in, with respect to the, the observer. Yeah, so you don't know if you are or not. It, it's potential, right. so the physicians may not treat each, each patient the same, and that could potentially throw off your outcome. And then what I was typing in about the translational is that I think there may have been some issues with their wording, and that may have been what you guys were talking about when they said it was prospective, because there's another spot that's kind of uniquely worded, which we'll get to it, I guess, once you do your statistical things. So I thought it was a translational thing of, of how they worded it as a prospective cohort. Um, and then they also said that this was a randomized, a single blinded randomized control trial. Those were my thoughts. Yeah, there, were, there were some odd parts of the article I found throughout, and I, I wondered which aspects of that were, like you said, a translational issue or, or something else. Um, so that was definitely one of them, which I, I wanted to point out because it did seem odd. Did you guys notice any other potential issues, by the way, with study design or statistical uh, setup for this, this patient, potentially, these patients? I thought it was interesting that they excluded patients with neutropenia, but one of the groups was induction. So, I mean, we always consider people in induction functionally neutropenic because they've got most of those penia cells. So that was one thing that I noticed. Them being excluded for neutropenia, yeah. Definitely interesting for this population. That's a great point. Um, as far as excluding neutropenic patients, um, what was your thoughts on the number of patients for an RCT for this trial that were in? Well, my thoughts on the their use of a RCT for this population is that what you're saying? 
the number of patients in the study for an RCT? Uh, um, I mean, the patient population isn't huge. The fact that it's an RCT, um, I think, helps isolate a little bit more as far as um, controlling for some unknown variables, especially when you're dealing with a population this small. But, I mean, a variation in just a, you know, one or two patients could, could sway whether the results are significant or not, which makes it a little harder to interpret. Yeah, totally. I agree with you there. So you you might would be concerned that this underpowered study based on the limited yeah. number of patients and the kind of 100 to 1,000 would be a better range for a good RCT if you can get it done. Yeah, I agree, especially when you're looking at a, a bunch of different factors. Like they're looking, for example, here for five different outcomes. When you've got a P of 0.05 and a sample size that small, um, uh, again, a, f a few different patients going one way or the other could, could make something look significant or not, and it's hard to say. Very good. I thought it was also interesting that they gave it for seven days and then they stopped. Uh, yeah. How we would get it. Probiotics yeah. for seven days, yeah. Um, so no, as far as the new routine, I, I go into a little bit later too. I mean, it's it's interesting because that's one of the concerns is if you give probiotics to a, a super immunocompromised patient that potentially have risk as well. Um, so it makes it a little harder to interpret for for actual complications from the probiotic versus more preventing complications. All right. So just to do a quick statistical sidetrack, I don't go too far into this, but I just wanted to mention real quick student t-test and the chi-square test. So for a student t-test, what you're mainly looking for is seeing if there's a statistical difference between the means of the two groups. So what you're doing is looking at the mean, the standard deviation um, for two groups and determining whether um, there's a significant, statistically significant difference in the, um, the means of the two groups that you can actually say that there is a difference and it's not due uh, simply to random chance. So in this case, again, it's, you're comparing means, you're looking at more of uh, assuming a standard distribution of the two, two groups and, and trying to tell are these two, two, two groups different. Uh, for a chi-squared test, you're more looking for an association, uh, see if there's an association and it's between two um, categorical variables. So for example, um, you have your actual observed events uh, in the two groups for for um, uh, each case, and then uh, comparing that to what you would expect um, to happen based on random chance, uh, and and actually calculating whether or not the difference um, is is statistically significantly different. Um, so you're not it's a it's not parametric. You're not a assuming um, that the distributions are symmetric, and it really depends on your sample size, and um, um, there's a lot of other factors to, to take into play for chi-squared tests versus just uh, normal standard distribution for, a, for means for a t-test. Uh, in both cases, though, you're, you're essentially comparing uh, um, the, the two groups and determining whether um, you're, it's a significant difference as in your p-value is less than 0.05 or not to, to, to figure out if there is a difference. Um, so as far as the what, uh, for randomization, uh, for the results, there was no statistical difference um, found in the age, the risk level, or the mean neutrophil count between the two, uh, two groups. Um, I didn't see any mention about the uh, value for the sex distribution of the two groups, which was interesting. Uh, both groups were predominantly male. So in the control group, 56% uh, were male versus 70% in the treatment group. Again, I didn't see anything about p-value or significant difference between the two groups, which is interesting because it was the most striking difference between the two groups of the things that they decided to mention or that they, they did check for. Um, so I'm not sure why there wasn't a p-value. I, I don't know what... <laughs> People had a different interpretation of that. Um, 
but as far as uh, the two groups, they were both relatively young. Um, um, so in each case that I list in this PowerPoint, the first number is for the control, the second is for the treatment. So 10.7 years old versus 10.8 in treatment. Um, for the percent that were high risk ALL, there were 60% in the control group, 56.6 in the treatment group, and the neutrophil count uh, was similar as well, with 43.50 in the control group and 43.14 um, in the treatment group. And the p-value in each of these cases um, were close to 0.05. They were not below 0.05, so they did not reach significant difference. Again, I'm still kind of interested in the, the sex distribution for the two groups because it's a 14% difference could be uh, significant. I don't know if people have thoughts on that as well, as far as if that would have an effect or, or the interpretation of that p value. Yeah, it looked to, I'm not sure about the sex, but it looks to me that they're just putting those in there with your age and your, your risk is that they're saying, hey, they're not statistically significant. So that, they're trying to argue that that's less likely to be a confounder for the results they're going to show for the GI stuff. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm, I'm more interested in the age, the risk level, and the fill count, but it is interesting they mention it. Um, but yeah, I guess it's more just uh, that they wanted to note that it was predominant in those cases. So there's uh, significant findings that were found. Uh, one was a uh, difference in GI manifestations or GI complications. So the treatment group, uh, about 30% um, had complications versus 63% in the treatment group. Um, so a significant difference of P, but, uh, 0 0.009, so much less than the 0 0.05 level. Uh, and the number needed to be calculated um, for this group was three, um, which is a, a pretty low number considering. Um, and then as far as antibiotic use, 26.6% um, uh, in the treatment group um, uh, use antibiotics during this period um, versus 53.3% in the control group. So again, a significant level of 0.03 with a similarly low number needed to treat of 3.7. Can you the non explain that? Yeah. Sorry, go back to your last slide if you don't mind. So antibiotic use, 26 versus 53%, they give you a p-value and the numbers needed to treat. Yeah. So are they... Are they drawing an association that a probiotic helps prevent you from not needing an antibiotic and they're giving you a number needed to treat? That seems very strange to me. How that do was you my assumption. Sorry? How do you interpret that? Um, that was my assumption, especially when they go in to results um, Later as well, they, they mentioned the microorganisms that were isolated um, during this period for the two groups um, in order to calculate whether the risk of getting an infection while on pro probiotics differs from getting an infection while not on probiotics. So I think what they were getting at is that taking the probiotics could potentially prevent um, uh, patients from uh, getting another infection. I think from my understanding, um, the, the idea is if you're giving a probiotic, you are um, uh, kind of protecting the gut flora, protecting the natural um, uh, microbiome that, that your body has uh, in order to, to help your body um, uh, prevent risk of, of getting an infection while on a probiotic. So that number needed to treat is essentially saying I mean, based on just you know, for for what that that term means, uh, saying about three or four patients would have to be treated uh, in order to have one uh, patient not have to be uh, taken an antibiotic for treatment of a of an infection. And and stool culture positive with diarrhea. Does that mean we should treat? Is the other question I would have. If they have diarrhea with a positive stool culture, yeah, should you should you treat? I mean, I'm seeing Staph aureus. There's there's Candida, uh, or um, there's, a, there's multiple different organisms. Pseudomonas. Should we? Does that merit treatment? I don't know the answer to that. I I mean I would say so if if they have um. Uh, 
bacteria in their, their uh, stool sample that's also associated with these GI complications that would be associated with this, then I, I would say, yeah, you should. Yeah, it's interesting, Chad, because I know where you come from, and I know that they do stool cultures as surveillance cultures all the time. Nobody else does that, or very few people do that. And so normally we're not getting positive stool cultures for fluconazole, or I mean for candida or something like that. So I think that's a good question, but I think it's, um, it's an academic medical center that, that does those studies routinely. And so clearly they, they didn't, or it doesn't sound like it. And I think a lot of people don't treat those kind of infections. Yeah, because to put a number needed to treat of three is is an incredibly remarkable low number of patients in the real world to treat. And to make that assumption that it's you're preventing antibiotic use, that's pretty strong. And what is that really being backed by? And there's a lot of loopholes there. Just because you have a positive culture, does that necessarily mean you would treat? Like you're saying, we a lot of places don't even check. So I, I'm very skeptical on on that part of the, the study there. It, it, says, it says under the isolation that they didn't treat for the GI or respiratory um, bacteria that we're seeing. It was just for the, especially a UTI, bacteremia, or clinical sepsis that they treated with antibiotics. So that even broadens it further. So how are probiotics preventing sepsis um, and UTI? I don't have a great answer. <laughs> how can you trust other people? <laughs> study? How can yeah, you, I agree. It's interesting. How can you trust the other results from this study if, if they're making that statement there? Yeah, and I don't see anything in the article where they, they attempt to explain that either. So uh, I don't have a great answer myself either. If they should have stuck with GI manifestations. <laughs> yeah, GI manifestations alone probably would be good, especially when, when they're expanding their scope this much. <coughs> like I said before, if you find something significant, it's harder to say whether that was random chance or not. Um, once you start bringing in other things that you can't explain, So as far as the non-significant findings, um, the were sepsis, hospitalizations, and visits to the emergency department. Um, again, it, it could be part of this is the small sample size that, that, that makes it less likely that they found a significant difference um, um, just because of the low power of the study. Uh, for example, in sepsis, um, the rates were 6.6% versus 23.3% in the treatment group. Uh, and then for hospitalization, it was 13.3% versus 30% in the treatment group for um, having a hospitalization, um, a subsequent hospitalization during that 30-day period. Um, so um, it's hard to say whether that was just uh, due to being underpowered or not uh, for this specific study. I will say another kind of gripe I had with this article, too, is when it talks about sepsis, there there is a part in the article where it talks about sepsis being a significantly different um, result between the two groups. But then it has a P of 0.07, and then in the conclusions as well as elsewhere in the, the article, it mentions sepsis as a not significant finding. So that's another aspect where I don't I don't think that's a translational issue. I think it might be an editing issue where they, they found that there was a big difference in sepsis, but then, I don't know, didn't account for the, the p-value or, or interpret it wrong. It's hard to say. Uh, but that was another kind of oddity I found in the, in the article. Um, so as far as the GI manifestations, um, uh, they, they kind of looked at each type of complication to, to determine what the actual um, complications were that they had. Um, so they looked at, at dyspepsia, abdominal distension, aneurysm, uh, constipation, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Um, so there was 
uh, decrease in each of these cases. Um, they, they mentioned uh, as far as all GI manifestations, they said there was a percent reduction of over 50 percent um, in the treatment group. Uh, it also mentions that the, there's a decrease in diarrhea and nausea of greater than 60 percent. Um, and I'm looking at this image, I don't, I don't understand where they're coming from in that number either, uh, because there's 16.6 percent uh, for diarrhea um, complications. Um, in the control group versus 10% in the treatment group. Um, that's not a decrease of more than 60%. That's less than 50%. Uh, and then for nausea, it says it's decreased by 66%, which that looks like a decrease of more than like 33%. So I'm not sure. It's reporting that as a, uh, like instead of, it should be, it goes down by a third, but instead they're saying, so like if you, the so 66% of something is decreased by a third. If you take one, multiply by yeah. 0.66, you get, it goes down by a third, but to your final number is 0.6. So that's, like that's what that's saying. They're just reporting it in a way other than how it was. Yeah. That, this was one where I think might have been a translational issue, because the wording they use, is, it says the decrease in diarrhea and nausea was more than 60%, which, yeah, I, I think the wording was m more of the issue in this case, that it it was a, it was 60%, not a decrease of 60%. Um, but again, it is, it is striking that each of these complications um, was found to be less um, among each of these categories. Um, I don't see any uh, uh, significant, um, like calculations of significance in this case, but um, still as far as just looking at a general um, summary of the results, it is interesting. Oh, there we go. Um, as far as emergency department visits, um, uh, main thing is the GI in uh, infections, which were the main reason for uh, visits to the emergency department during this follow-up period for the two groups. Um, uh, for the um, non-probiotic uh, group, the, the percent of emergency or the percent of patients who had an emergency department visit in that 30-day period was 20% versus the probiotic um, or treatment group, which um, uh, was 6.6%. So this was a, a case where a um, p-value uh, of 0.04 was calculated. So there was a significant, statistically significant difference in. Um, um, in, in these two groups. And then uh, as far as, um, um, let's see, as far as other complications, respiratory or urinary tract, skin, soft tissue or others, I didn't see a big difference. There was uh, actually more for skin and soft tissue and others, but again, it could just be random chance. And then um, for hospitalizations, again, most of your hospitalizations uh, are for uh, GI complications. Um, and there is a significant uh, drop uh, in GI complications when you're comparing the, the two groups. Um, there, there's also a decrease in respiratory and urinary tract um, hospitalizations, which is, a, uh, like we talked about before, it's, it's hard to say what the association is for that for, for patients on probiotics, um, but it's, again, definitely interesting as well. And then for microorganisms that were isolated, um, again, I mean, it, it is it's striking as far as the, the, the last column here for isolation, um, 14 um, patients in the control group um, had um, isolation of uh, a bacteria versus in a probiotic group, which was uh, four patients. So uh, it's it's a pretty big difference as far as um, how many isolated cases there were uh, with a p-value, which is less than 0.05. It's 
a lot of zeros there, 0.00000004. Um, again, we've got a smaller sample size, but even still, that's, that is fairly striking uh, of a difference since we have an N of only 30 in each group anyway. I think 14 um, out of the 30 get uh, isolated um, uh, cultures is interesting. I don't know what if people had interpretations for each of these results that they thought were interesting or had were worth mentioning. It's blood culture, yeah. And then the census, would that include census? Like, what, where did they grow that from? Census blood? Census blood. Again, I had been digging in the methods. I could not find the methods for what, what, what sepsis the category was for that. Septic, their blood culture. I would guess so, but so, so then you think there'd be cross like there's there's strip uh, Canada staff and virulence for the culture group, but there's still Canada for the sepsis group as well as staff aureus. So I don't know if these right. are different patients where they're counting them twice. I would hope they're not counting them twice, but I agree. I don't I don't know where these categories are actually drawn. Yeah, there's a pseudomonas under stool culture. It's not a pseudomonas blood culture, so. Um, there is for sepsis, but yeah, not there's not a result for pseudomonas in the culture. So okay. then there's pseudomonas in soft tissue as well. I don't. <laughs> um, I also don't know. Like it doesn't talk about why these organisms were, like if they were drawn because of side effects that patients had or, or, or because they were being monitored, they just checked stool cultures during that period or what, it's hard to say. Um, so as far as findings, um, there was a significant reduction in GI complications and antibiotic use that we talked about between the two groups. And there did seem to be a reduction in ED visits and hospitalizations as well as um, sepsis rates uh, between the two groups, but it was, was non-significant. So the limitations of this, um, one was the small sample size. Again, we only have uh, NF30 in each two groups, which uh, could potentially underpower a lot of the results, uh, especially with respect to these, these reductions that we uh, found in ED visits, hospitalizations, and sepsis. So I don't know if there, there truly is a difference that wasn't captured due to low power or if it was more just random chance. So that's one limitation from the sm small sample size. Um, one was it being a single blinded uh, study, which could um, be more prone to bias potentially. Um, there is some limited generalizability too, just for the fact that this was specifically a population of family members of. Uh, uh, workers in the petroleum, engine, uh, uh, petroleum industry in, in Mexico City um, for patients with ALL um, under 17. Um, so as far as applying those results to uh, Roanoke, uh, there is some limited generalizability, though the hope is that um, the ALL is the same, the uh, probiotics are the same, so it should still apply, but it's hard to say without, um, without further studies. And again, as far as the longer term effects, it's hard to say. We're only following them for 30 days during this period. Typically, you'd expect these GI manifestations to show up during that period, but there are other complications that could show up as well um, uh, longer term, whether it's as a complication from the probiotics or um, uh, potential benefits from the probiotics as well. So as far as reaching the goals, um, as far as what they performed for their study, what, what values they were looking at, the calculations that they met, made, I think they, uh, personally, I feel like they were in line with what the goals were, which was essentially looking 
um, at GI complications, antibiotic use, ED visits, hospitalizations, and sepsis um, with re relation to, to um, getting probiotics um, uh, for ALL patients. Um, but as far as the interpretation of the results or how the data was actually collected, it's not really clear for me as far as whether those goals were, were met because um, there's still a little bit that's kind of fuzzy uh, in reading through the, the paper. Um, and I, I, as far as reaching the goals, I think a much larger sample size would help to reach those goals as well because we still don't have a clear answer for some of these complications. Uh, and then um, as far as the, the side effects from uh, probiotic use, it mentions that there were no side effects um, from probiotics that were documented uh, in, in the treatment group, but I don't see any mention of how those were monitored, what side effects were potentially monitored, things like that, what they were actually looking for as far as um, complications for the probiotic group. Um, I mean, obviously, as we mentioned before, it's possible that uh, severely immunocompromised patients could potentially even have infections as a complication from getting the probiotic. But besides that, um, it doesn't really go into what they were actually looking for for complications. Um, what do you guys feel about as far as them reaching their goals for this study? Hey, this is Dr. Ward. So you did a great job looking at this and, and teasing out some of the things with this study and the limitations and, and talking about it. I will say it's okay to not be nice about it. I mean, this is a very flawed study. There's, I mean, especially when they're delving into the numbers needed to treat with their low power um, and sample size. And, you know, they have statistical errors all throughout. And so, like, it's, it's, for me, it's a fatal study. Like, some of the things they had is pretty fatal, and it's hard for me to want to take this and apply it elsewhere. You can, you can uh, take bits and pieces of it, but I don't think you can go along. There's just too many issues with the, with the article. Um, and I'm a little surprised it did get published the way it did. Um, I'm not sure kind of what led to that background um, of, of published. I, I don't know. The, um, the other things I would say, I was going to ask Dr. Atkins, and the, they were putting in their background the leukemia death rate was about 5.6 per hundred oh it's per hundred thousand citizens for all that seems to be pretty good uh, especially for for mexico and their rule yeah uh, i don't know why they would be doing better than we are so i, that, I that, also mentioned that and historically <laughs> when i was at i was at saint jude like there were there was major efforts there was a new global initiative they were doing in helping the folks in Mexico with improving their mortality because it was so, it was so much higher than it is in the U S. Um, so there's some yeah. statistical things here with the study and their background information too. They're not using the same chemotherapy that we use either yeah, which, for induction or for reinduction, which would be delayed here. There's definitely a limitation as well as far as comparing results to and you mentioned when you were doing your summaries earlier of other trials that have been done, I believe you mentioned an RCT with about 150 patients. Is that right for probiotic usage in the Hemont population? From what I found, yes. And that was several years back, and that was also a positive study? Yes. That was looking at um, stage, I was it's hard to find these studies and it's yeah. just as hard to find those that that seem to be against them because of the neutropenia and the immunocompromised state yeah so they're looking at grade three grade four diarrhea um, for and this is in 2007 yeah some time ago yeah I'm, I'm surprised there's I mean, that's partly why I wanted to present on the topic. Um, uh, I couldn't find a lot of articles that were relevant on the topic. Um, 
And I found this one interesting. It was just, it was striking to me as well, once I started digging through the article itself, um, the fact that, I mean, this was peer reviewed and still there were some things that seemed to make it through that even just the simple editing process that I yeah. would have been, like, I'm surprised by. For example, not even catching that at one point it says that there's a statistically significant difference in sepsis rates. Like, that's, yeah. that's just an editing error. So, yeah. Um, Good you picked up on that stuff because it's it's amazing sometimes what will get published in these in these articles. The the impact factor for this journal, I just looked it up. I think it's around one point eight, which is on yeah. the lower side. I mean, you're not gonna make big impacts with this type of journal as compared to say JAMA or New England journal much higher. And so there may be may not go through the rigor and the editors may not be as in tuned with looking at some of these details and that slips by. I agree with your caution. I agree with your assessment, and it's okay to say this is a bad. This is a bad. This is a bad study. Yeah. It's totally fine. Um, I was curious as well for for you, Dr. Atkinson, as far as journal journals in this topic. Obviously, we're not going to have an impact factor for that JAMA does, but I was curious what articles or which journals. You and pediatric blood and cancer is is like the, our Bible journal. Yeah. Um, if you don't get accepted into that one, then you go to something like this. So, and then blood and, you know, those kind are, are more for generalizable big phase three studies that the Children's Psychology Group puts out. So, did I answer your question? Yeah. I mean, I've heard of this journal. I just didn't, I mean, looking at the impact factor, um, I didn't know how it compared. It used to be the big one before pediatric blood and cancer came yeah. out. Um, so when I saw that this was published there, I was like, well, that's probably good enough to be not a flawed study. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, kind of it's my general thoughts on this. Sorry? Yeah. Did you present this? So that you, it, it gives us the opportunity to kind of go through it and look at some of the flaws and, like, be shocked by it. So, yeah, I thought you did a good job. Thank you. Um, I mean, in general, I think it, it is interesting. I, I was curious, um, kind of people's thoughts too on, I mean, obviously there's some flaws in the study, but there were some interesting results as well. Um, whether, like, um, I mean, I, for example, I, I, there's a lot of websites out there that, were, that are specifically oriented towards um, patients, information for, and, and they'll recommend give probiotics um, to your patients with, or to your kids who have ALL and are having GI issues, things like that. But um, I think people thought as far as I mean, kind I think of prophylactically so. giving it to patients. And I or, think looking at that in a randomized controlled study is, is worth it because there are a lot of studies that make claims like that. And we really don't know, you know, the value of probiotics in this population yet. So I think it would be worth doing it. Now, the fact that COG hasn't done it makes me think that maybe there are things out there that I don't know about that are saying that we shouldn't be doing it, but I'm not convinced that's the case. Yeah. Um, and I had a couple other things just to finish up what I was going through. I forgot I had a couple more slides. So, I mean, it, there is some clinical significance if these values are to be interpreted um, as presented um, as far as, that's a pretty strikingly low number needed to treat for GI complications. I, uh, avoiding antimicrobial use, and the fact that there was no complications uh, associated with the use of probiotics. So if these results are to be interpreted as, as stated, um, there is some potentially big benefit of giving probiotics to patients. I'm not going to read through their conclusion, but basically um, uh, he just kind of summarized what, what was said. I, I agree with, with what was said as far as interpreting what was put down as far as their um, being no significant difference in the uh, sepsis, ED visits, or hospitalizations, but there was a difference in GI complications or um, uh, and antibiotic use. Um, I didn't know if people had thoughts on the conclusion there. Um, but it starts overall. Um, 
this is kind of, I think we've kind of touched on most of these things. There's, there's not much that's known still about probiotics for um, patients in chemotherapy. A lot of it's based on what we know about um, other patients who are immunocompromised that we give probiotic, probiotics to, patients who are, uh, have organ transplants, if they're um, are already on antibiotics for something else and they have diarrhea, that it does have benefits to them. And it seems like a lot of that kind of transplanting that information over to patients um, with um, ALL, um, but it's still kind of limited still. So we don't know all the benefits, especially when they're looking at like uh, UTIs and such. Uh, I think a lot more <laughs> needs to be known, uh, especially if there is actually any association between those types of infections because uh, we'd have to explore, first of all, whether there is a di difference and then if there is, why there is a difference, the actual uh, mechanism of these things. Um, so I've kind of touched on this as well. Um, immunocompromised patients, there are potentially some risks in them, them getting probiotics. It's generally accepted that many of these infections are endogenous in origin, but um, like, for example, here, if, if we had included or if they had included uh, neutropenic patients, those risks would definitely have to be considered, um, especially when we're looking at generalizability. I don't want to be treating patients who are severely neutropenic based on the study because it excluded the, the patients who potentially could be at highest risk for um, uh, getting an infection from taking probiotics. Um, so I was just curious people's thoughts on, on kind of the, how they want to, how they would treat patients based on, on these results or based on what we know about probiotics. And I kind of talked about that already, but in general thoughts on this or the study in general? Yeah, definitely still up in the air. Um, I think it's interesting enough that more studies should be done on the topic. Though. Um, and then I've got the article here if people want to look it up for themselves. Good job, Thank you. Thank you.